Hi, I'm Dr. Molly Gebrian. Thanks for joining me for this series of videos on mental practicing. I've wanted to make these for a while and I finally have time, so that's very exciting. If you've watched my videos on what musicians can learn about practicing from current brain research, you know there's a video in there on mental practicing. I'm going to review that quickly here, so we're starting from the same place, but if you want to watch that full video, I recommend doing that. I'll link to it um, below in the comments. So in that video, I discuss a study that was done on non-musicians where they had to learn to play a simple five note scale up and down on the piano. Um, and some people learned it by physically practicing on the piano, some people learned it by mental practicing, um, and they had five days to learn this thing. And the really astounding thing from that study is they found that not only did the brain change in the physical practicers, but it also changed in the mental practicers. More specifically, the part of the brain that controlled their fingers that were playing this little scale got bigger, both in the physical practice people and the mental practice people. I get lots of questions about mental practicing, so I wanted to make this series of videos to try to answer some of those for people. So we're going to look at some more studies that were done on um, mental and physical practicing. We're going to look at more recent research on uh, different ways to do mental practicing that may, may be especially beneficial. We'll look at what happens in the brain when somebody's mental practicing in addition to, you know, that part getting bigger like we talked about. Um, Hopefully I'll answer some, some common questions, including what if I'm not very good at mental practicing? Like I can't actually feel or hear anything very well inside my head. It is all lost for me. Um, so let's start with some studies that were done looking at both mental and physical practice, but especially the combination between the two. There's a number of studies that have looked at what happens when people mental practice something, physical practice something, or do both. They have some mental practice and some physical practice. And what these find is that the combination of the two is better than either one alone. So doing both mental and physical practice is better than just physical practice by itself and just mental practice by itself. In fact, what they find in these studies when they probe people's mental representations, that's basically their understanding of the skill and how it's supposed to work, when they probe people's mental representations, they find that the mental representations are more detailed, more organized, clearer in people that have done mental practicing. Typically you find these especially rich, clear, organized mental representations in people that are at a higher level of skill. And so it seems that when people do mental practicing, they understand the skill better, which gets them to a higher level of performance. A lot of the research that I discussed was done on athletes and not on musicians, but I do want to discuss um, a mental practicing study today that was done with guitar players. And um, what I like about this is two things. One, it's longer than just a very short amount of time. A lot of the mental practice studies with musicians give them like 10 minutes to practice and then they have to perform, which is not really realistic to what we do. Um, and so this guitar study takes place over a longer period of time. And also it's looking at the effect of mental practicing on memorization. And that's something that I get a lot of questions about. Is this beneficial for memorization? Should I be using this in my quest to memorize something? Um, so let's look at this study. There were two groups in this study, the physical practice group and the combination group who did mental and physical practice. The goal was for them to learn a new piece on guitar and to memorize it. So on the first day, they all came to the lab and they had 30 minutes to practice. The physical practice group practiced physically for 30 minutes. The mental practice group was given 20 minutes of mental practice and 10 minutes of physical practice. So 30 minutes total, but most of it was mental practice. And at the end of that first practice session, they had to perform the piece from memory as best they could, basically to get a baseline to see where they were. Then they were all sent home and they were given five days to practice. And on each of these five days, they were only allowed to do 30 minutes of practice on this piece they were learning. The physical practice group, again, had to do all 30 minutes physically practicing the piece. The combination group did 20 minutes of mental practice, 10 minutes of physical practice each day. At the end of the week, they came back into the lab and recorded another memorized performance to compare to their baseline performance on the first day. The final thing they did was 10 days later, so a 10 day break where they were not allowed to practice, they came back into the lab one more time and recorded one more performance. They found that on that second performance, the one after five days of practicing, that the mental practice group was starting to pull ahead in terms of their performance ability. 
This difference was not statistically significant, which means basically that the difference wasn't big enough um, to count for scientists. But you can see on the graph here, they are, that group is starting to pull ahead. The real difference was seen 10 days later when they came back to perform it one more time without having done any practice in between. Then the mental practice group was clearly doing better at performing this piece from memory. And so this study indicates that not only is the combination of mental and physical practice better than just physical practice alone, but it also creates much more durable memory and skill for the piece. And this is something that you find in a variety of studies, that the skill is more durable and more consistent over time when there's mental practicing involved. So the combination group did uh, really not that much physical practice at all, right? They had 10 minutes on the first day, and then they had 10 minutes on every one of those five days. So basically they had an hour of physical practice, and that's it, the rest was mental practice. So that's pretty impressive. This obviously saves a lot of wear and tear on the body, which is a big issue for all of us, instrumentalists, singers, everybody, right? We need to protect our bodies. One question I get a lot is, okay, what is mental practicing? What am I supposed to be doing when I mental practice? So you should be trying to feel and hear inside your head everything you need to be aware of when you actually play your instrument. So I'll use the example of string players because that's what I do. So we need to be aware of what finger or fingers we're using, what position we're in, what strings we're on, what we're doing with our vibrato for the bow, up bow or down bow, where in the bow, the bow stroke, what string we're on, the bow placement, the bow weight, the bow speed, the quality of sound we want, the pitch um, of, of the music, the phrasing, the shape, the tension um, in the phrase, what we're trying to convey to the audience, the character, all of these things that we need to be aware of when we actually play. I know that that list is overwhelming. Um, so just start with one that feels like it might be easier for you to feel or hear inside your head. For some people, that's feeling what their fingers have to do. Pick a passage and a very short, easy passage and just see, okay, can I feel my fingers moving at the right time? For some people, it's the pitch. Can they hear, um, you know, the music, the, the musical, the melodic line in their head? For some people, it's the quality of sound. They can hear the quality of sound they want. Maybe the pitches aren't as clear, but the quality of sound is clear. Whatever it is that is clearest to you, start with that thing and see if you can hear it inside your head or feel it inside your head. And then gradually add different parameters to it. Another common question I get is, can you move? Should you just be totally still when you're doing this or should you try to move? Some of the, most of the actually older research on mental practicing had people do it absolutely stock still. And often they would have sensors on whatever muscles would be involved to actually do the skill to make sure that people were not moving. Um, but more recent research has looked at something called dynamic mental practice, which is basically when people move in a really tiny way. And so for me as a string player, instead of mental practicing and like doing full bow strokes or, you know, full left hand motions, maybe I do like little baby bow strokes or like little baby finger motions. Um, and that research on dynamic mental practicing has found that it's better than being stock still if you do little baby versions of whatever motion it is. Um, so being still is still be very beneficial, um, but if you find it really difficult to mental practice without moving, just doing little baby motions seems to be more beneficial than staying still. A more recent area of research on mental practicing is something called AOMI, which stands for Action Observation and Motor Imagery. So the action observation part is kind of obvious, I think, to us as musicians why it would be beneficial. I mean, demonstration is such an important part of our learning, right? Your teacher demonstrates something so you know how to do it and then you try. And so it's kind of obvious to us why observing somebody doing the skill would help. In AOMI, so the motor imagery part of that is mental practicing, as we've been talking about, feeling, feeling how it feels. When you do AOMI, you do, you observe somebody doing the skill and you mental practice at the same time. So you can either do them simultaneously or alternating back to back. If you're going to do it simultaneously, you would watch somebody doing the skill you're trying to learn, either live or on a video, and you would mental practice at the same time. So feel yourself do it while the person is doing it. 
If you're going to do them back to back, you would watch somebody do it, then mental practice, then watch again, then mental practice and alternate like that. And they found that this method of doing mental practice, observation and mental practice at the same time is better than mental practice on its own. This area of research is really new. I just learned about it about mm, a, a year ago, I guess. And so I haven't had much chance to experiment with it myself, but I have started using it in my own teaching. And so what I'll do is whatever I'm working on with one of my students, I will demonstrate for them like I've always done, but I'll ask them to mental practice it at the same time as I'm doing it. And the students I've tried this with have said, oh, wow, <laughs> that actually works really well. Um, to mental practice it and feel myself do it while I'm watching you do it. So this is something that teachers try out with your students. You can also try it out with yourself. There is evidence that even watching a video of yourself, even if you're making mistakes, as long as you know you're making mistakes, that can be just as beneficial as watching an expert do it, say. So try this out in your own practicing. Take a video of yourself doing whatever it is you're working on and then watch the video and mental practice at the same time. And I think you'll find some interesting benefits. All right, that's the end of this video. So in the next video, we're going to talk about the brain activation you find when people are doing mental practicing and also answer the question of, I'm not very good at mental practicing. I can't really feel or hear things very well in my head. Should I even bother with this or can I get better at it? So hopefully you'll join me over in part two.